Good morning. Good to um, see everybody today. Um, we just finished uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation today. And uh, let's give everybody, uh, let's, give, let's everybody give um, Lewis a clap right now, please. Because it was a tough, it was a tough book, and he stuck to it. It's not the easiest book to actually um, teach. Um, so we finished that up. Next week we'll be starting a new study um, for Sunday school, and um, uh, just want to just want to uh, give uh, I want to give Lewis some props for for uh, for just taking it on. He put his helmet on and sort of has to tackle it. <laughs> so I'm um, Pastor Kelly. Um, thanks for being here today. Today is the last day of 2023. It's December uh, 31st. 2023. Um, it's also one, two, three, one, two, three. You know that? Everybody say one, two, three, one, two, three. You can say one, two, three, one, two, three because it's December 31st, 23. So that's unique. And we made it, right? We made it. Everybody's here. We made it another year, which is good. You know, it's good because some people didn't make it. Um, and you know, I, I feel I do feel I feel bad for you know I feel bad I feel it's 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 not good you know some people didn't make it to today, tomorrow is going to be 2024 but you know we we made it God had us and he and he protected us and he blessed us with another year He's given us He gave us 365 days of life in 23, hopefully He gives us 366 days of life in 2024 because it's a leap year. I don't, I don't know if you know that right there. It's a leap year, and. It's, it's one of the many things that we should be thankful for. And, but we cannot dismiss the fact that time is flying by very quickly. And when I, actually, when I was preparing the sermon, it actually made me think of the word vapor. Vapor. And the Bible compares our time on earth to a vapor of water. And I want to turn to... Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on the screen. I'm going to turn to it, but James 4.14, and it talks about this. In James 4.14, part B says, For what is life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time, then, va then vanishes away. To vanish means to disappear very quickly, to, vi to disappear suddenly. In other translations uh, for James 4.14, they replace the word vapor and they state that our life is like a puff of smoke. It's like a mist of steam. It's like a morning fog. And uh, I think last week or last couple weeks has been foggy, hasn't it? It's been foggy. So it's like a, so it's like a, a morning fog. And the translation doesn't really matter. The point is, is that, the point is, is that up here, life goes very, it goes by very quickly, doesn't it? It goes by very quickly. You know, some of us are in different ages and stages and seasons of our life, but it just like it just it just it goes by, it flies back, it flies by so quick. Man, it's just like you just you can sometimes you talk to somebody who's older and they say, you know what, I remember in my teens and my twenties, and they're like fifties and sixties, or they might, you know, it just doesn't really matter, but time just goes by so quickly. But the thing about time is that it's not prejudice or racist or it, it doesn't discriminate. And time cannot be bought. It can't be manipulated. Um, there are 24 hours in a day, no matter how you roll the dice. That's why time is so valuable because it's a, it's a, it, it's, 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 it's precious. And it's often said that time is your most valuable commodity. And a commodity is something that is useful and valuable, especially something that is bought and sold. Food is a commodity. We need it to, to survive, don't we? We need food. Transportation and shelter are commodities. We need somewhere, we need, we need, uh, we need uh, a vehicle to drive around. We need a place to lay our head down at night. But however, we also need time to do them because it doesn't matter if you have food if you don't have if you have no time to eat it. And this is why and this is why time is so important and considered a commodity. And this is going to be up on the screen right here. Time can be considered a commodity commodity in the sense, sorry, in the sense that it is a valuable resource that can be traded, spent, and invested. Time can be traded. It can be spent. It can be invested. 
And we all, all of us here, we get to trade our time, we get to spend our time, and we get to invest our time the way that we want to each day. And that's a powerful reality. That just, it, it, it just, it, it shines a spotlight on the, 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 the power and importance of the time. And I want to show you this chart that I found right here. I just went past it. Sorry, difficulties, there it goes again, I'm sorry. I want to show you this chart. Um, right here, I want to show you this chart, I'm sorry. This chart right here, um, it shows you, it, 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 it talks about time. It gives you a little bit of uh, a background on drop time. Every day you get, every day you get up, you have 24 hours in a day, which equates to 1,440 minutes, which equates to 86,400 seconds. Time, it's it's in, in every day. Um, your time is non-refundable. It's non-renewable. You can, it's not like a renewable resource. So it, it 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 all it all brings you to the point that you have to be very selective of how you use your time. Amen. Be very selective of how you use your time. And today I want to focus on this statement, which James four four fourteen is a backdrop. We know that life is like a vapor because the Bible says it is. And we also know that time is always moving and stops for no one. That's why we have to embrace the word commitment. We have to embrace the word commitment. The title of today's message, it's not gonna, the title of today's message is called All In. And today I want to look at what biblical commitment means and what it looks like. So if you could join me in prayer, we're going to pray, then we're going to get right into the message. Dear God, we just thank you for today, God. God, we thank you for, for bringing us to December 31st, 2023, God. You, you were with us, God. You, you sustained us, God. You kept us healthy. God, you kept us, you kept, you kept our lungs breathing, our heart beating. And God, we, we're thankful for that, God. And God, I pray that today, this message, God, it just really, it just really um, impacts each one of us, God, that we just realize that we... All, we, we have time, but time is, is a very precious commodity, and, and you want us to use it the way you want us to use it. So God, I pray that it just um, it saturates people's hearts and spirits and minds, and, and God, and, and it, just, it just, people leave change when they leave, when they leave here. And we thank you for everything that you're doing in the world today, in our lives today, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, so each year... Each year, I always pray. I always pray, and I and it's like I always pray, and I say, and I ask God. I said, God, give me. A, could you give me a word for the church for the upcoming year? And some of you weren't here back when when I started this because I started pastoring here in 2020. But in 2000, at the end of 2020, I actually I asked God. I said, give me a word for 2021, and that word was stand your ground. I don't know if you remember that. You remember that? Stand your ground, and that meant don't budge. Don't budge. Don't don't budge. Don't budge from um, from what God is calling you to. Don't don't budge in your relationship. In 2022, God, the word for the church was fix your eyes, and that was to focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus, the author and finisher of life. Right. In 2023, last year, it was the word was just do it, and it was about being um, being doers and not just hearers. And, uh, and, and after that, and obviously I've been praying about this. I've been praying about um, the word for 2024. And the word for 2024 was all in. Everybody say all in. All in. And God gave me the scripture. He gave me this verse right here. The scripture right here is in, it's in Luke 9.23. And it says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. I know we've heard this verse before, but Luke, Luke 9, 23 is about priorities. It's about order. It's about rank. It's about importance. It's about prerogative. And in this passage in, in 9, 23, Jesus was talking to his disciples, letting them know the reality of following him. And he starts off by saying, if, 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 if any of you want to follow me, 
And this is a choice you have to make if you're going to follow Jesus. You have to make the choice. You've got to say, I'm going to follow Jesus or you're not going to follow Jesus. Um, it's basically to choose or not to choose. That's the dilemma we face daily. And this is what trips up most people, many people, is the choice to follow Jesus. Because you can follow Jesus on Sundays and Wednesdays, but do you follow him the other five days? Do you, do you follow his commands? Do you, command, do you follow his commands every day? Or is it just part-time? Because God doesn't want us to be part-time Christians. He wants us to be full-time Christians who obey his commands, who follow him, and listen to him daily. Amen. And people, and people they, they struggle because they, they you know, they... When God says, follow me, it's, it, it, you have, it's this internal battle that they, that, it, that, they, that they fight. Do I do what Jesus wants me to do, or do I do what I want to do? And, and that's the question you have to make. And after you make a choice, if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to decide to give up your own way. And this is where it gets very complicated. It gets complicated. And giving up your own way is where most Christians is where what most Christians struggle with. You can you can love God. I want you to hear this. You can love God, but not enough to give up your own way because denying yourself is tough. It's to, it's hard to deny yourself because we live in a culture that loves self, and the Bible actually speaks about this right here about this love of self. You know we we we. I don't think I don't think people in general have problems loving themselves. They love themselves a lot. <laughs> I, I, I would say they do. But Second Timothy, Second Timothy, um, verse uh, chapter three, verses one through two talks about this, this 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 love of self. It says, "But understand this: that in the last days, which I believe that we're in, dangerous times of great of great stress and trouble will come. Difficult days." That will be hard to bear, and this is where this is what I want to this is what I want to focus on. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of self, narcissistic, self-focused, lovers lovers of money, impelled by greed, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. Lovers of self. And like I, like I said uh, just a couple minutes, like a minute ago, God's creation has no problem loving themselves. What they, what they do have a problem with is loving beyond themselves. People do love, but they opt, they, but they opt and off, they often opt out when it requires commitment. And I, and I said this before many times that people, they don't, a lot of people don't like commitment. Because because commitment means giving up your own ways and your own desires. When you're committed, you can't be self-absorbed. You can't be self-centered when you're committed. And this is in in self-absorption and self-centeredness is why is why there's two reasons, two main reasons why people don't respond to God. Because because people like being in charge, and it's hard to be obedient when you have control issues. If God asks you to do something today, he means today. He doesn't, he doesn't mean tomorrow. He doesn't mean um, next week. He doesn't mean when you feel like doing it. And this is up on the screen right here. And this came from, this is from John Revere. Even he said this in his study. Delayed obedience is not obedience at all. If you delay your obedience, it's not obedience. Obedience is 100%. Everybody say 100. Zero, zero. It's 100%. It's not 99.9. Nine. It's 100. Zero, zero. So if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to be obedient. And I want to go to uh, I want to go to Luke chapter fifth, uh, chapter 9 verses 57 and 62. And this actually talks about obedience. And this is a, this talks about the cost of following Jesus. Let's start with verse 57. It says, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Be careful what you say. 58, verse 58 says, but Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests. But the son of man, the son of God has no place even to lay his head. 
you know, we, we, we see this, 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 you know, 57, you know, the, in 58, Jesus didn't tell the man he couldn't follow him. He told him the reality of being a disciple. The reality of being a disciple when what God was, what Jesus was telling this guy was there's no house in There's no house in You know why? We don't have any house in There's no apartments. There's no one bedroom studio. There's no pillows or blankets. That's that's something God Jesus just gave it to him real. He said, "You know what? Hey, I don't have a place to um, lay my head. The offer is here. The offer is here." And Jesus just he wanted the man to know what it really what it, what it, what it really would be like to follow him. Amen. Let's continue in verse 59. And Jesus continues, and he said to another person, come follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first, let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. So this man, unlike the first man, the first man actually, he actually told Jesus, he, he I'm going to follow you. But this guy was invited by Jesus, and he had other things that he needed, he needed, that he felt needed to be done, that he needed to do. And this man was torn, like many people are torn. Many people were torn. I got something to do. Jesus is asking me to do this. I got something to do. Jesus is asking me to do this. And this man right here, do I leave everything and go, or do I stay and do what I think needs to be done? And there are many things in life. We have to, we have to realize there are many things in life that are, that are important. Amen? And we know this is the truth. There are many things in life that are important. And I, and I understand this. You understand this. Your neighbor understands this. But is God calling? But God is calling us to things that are more important than you're not. Um, if, but God is calling us to things that are more important um, that you're not going to like or agree with. And we live in this dichotomy every day. And it all comes down to choice. And, it, 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 and the choice comes down between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of your life. And this, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of your life or your agenda, it, this is what separates individuals. It, it separates Christians. It separates churches. Because there are churches out there, they're not doing what God is asking them to do. They're just, they're just, they're coming to church, just having church. Oh, let's throw, let's sing a couple hymns and let's just, let's, let's throw like a couple hallelujahs out there and stuff like that. And God's good with it. But that's not how it is. That's not how it is. And it even, and, and even this dichotomy even separates nations because there are entire nations that are not actually doing the will of God. They're doing the will of their, of their, of their, of their government. They're doing the will of, their, of the people that live there. But they're not actually following God. They're following their own agenda. And I do believe, and, I, and I've, I've, had, I've heard many pastors and many people who study Bible, there are going to be entire nations that end up going to hell because they have chosen collectively to reject Jesus. Collectively. Nations. We're not talking about like a town, a city. We're talking about nations. Whole people, whole people groups that live in a certain territory are probably going to be going to hell because they've rejected Jesus. And that's not good. In verse 61, this is another example. Another said, another person said, yes, Lord, I will follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. The dilemma. The dilemma. But Jesus, verse 62, but Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. This last man that Jesus made an offer to was dealing with the reality of being all in. And, he was, and the reality was, do I say my goodbyes first, then go, or do I go immediately? And Jesus says we, we Jesus says we have to have the same commitment and determination in, in verse in verse 62 as a farmer plowing a field who must do it with all his strength by always looking forward. And this is something, you know, I'm not, I don't come from the agricultural
cultural background, but this is something that was very interesting. Farmers want the rolls of crops, and we have a couple farmers here that grew up on farms. Farmers want the rolls of crops straight for optimal growing. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning, I learned stuff, but when you study, you learn. And, and the reason they want, the farmers want their rolls um, straight because when crops are planted in straight rolls, light absorption is maximized. And when passage between rolls is enhanced, which increases air circulation, it lessens the chance of wind damage to plants. I didn't know that. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Now if I plant, if I buy a farm, I'm going to know that. I'm going to know that if I'm plowing the, on the, the field, the plow straight lines because I want the maximum, the maximum that God has for me. Amen. Huh. Well, you might not think it's um, you might not think it's like it's cool, but I think I think it's great. <laughs> but what? But the thing about it is that when we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, we maximize the opportunity to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Amen. When we, mag when we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, we maximize, just like the farmer the, who, 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 um, who plows the straight, line, the straight lines for his crops. When we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, we maximize, everybody say maximize, the opportunity to bring the kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven to earth. That's good. That's good. That's good. The opportunities will increase to see miracles. We talk about this stuff all the time. We want to see miracles. Amen. If we want to see miracles, we got to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Yes. We will see mir an increase in miracles. We will experience revivals. We'll see strongholds break because people have strongholds in their life. That's just that's something that's real. But when there's people being set free from the chains of captivity, Amen. Amen. Chains of captivity. There's some people walking around now. There are Christians walking around now that are chained up. Yeah, they, they think they're free, but they're not free. They're walking around with chains on their back of their hands and stuff like that. Sometimes you see it. Sometimes you might not see it. But they're walking around with chains. They're captive. They have strongholds. In the book of Luke talks about this. The book of Luke talks about this. The physician. Luke the physician. And let's go to... Let's go to Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And it says, and this is about keeping your eyes focused on, on heaven. The spirit of, this is Jesus right here. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed. You are anointed. Do you understand that you're anointed? The spirit of God is in you. You are anointed. Everybody say it. I'm anointed. Say it like you mean it. I'm anointed. Miracles, healings, break strongholds, break chains of captivity. The Spirit, this is Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus says, Jesus says, we're going to do the same things he does and even more. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The poor in spirit, the, the, the financially poor, every, the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to captives and recover his sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. Lots of oppressed people right now. Verse 19, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. The favorable, the favorable year of the Lord is now. And Jesus read this prophetic message. It's a prophetic message that's from the book of Isaiah. And it was prophesied that there would be one that would come that would be all in. Everybody say all in. All, all in. in. It would be one that would come that would be all in. And this, this coming Messiah, this, one, this, this person who was going to be all in would bring the kingdom of heaven to earth so we can experience God in true life. That's what, the, that's what it was about. That's what the prophecy was about. We can experience true life, not life, not, not, a, not, a, not a life that's, that's, that's downtrodden, but a true life, abundant life. When Jesus came, he showed the world. He shows us. He showed us what heaven looks like and how it operates when you're all in. 
And I know that God gave me this word for 2024 because he wants all of us, he wants us all in. Do you understand? He wants us all in. He doesn't want us to just do church. He wants us all in. He wants the church to be the church. Yes, can, can, get, can we get someone? Can we get something? Can we get another amen or some claps or something? He wants the church to be the church he had designed it to be. When God, when the church was created, there was a purpose for the church, and it wasn't to be a pew potato, and it wasn't just to come here on two Sundays and Wednesdays to just to, just to show up and just to check the box. Amen. Jesus didn't check the box. Jesus showed the world what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He shows us. We have the blueprints. The church, you know, we talk about the church. What type of church do I want to be? The church is in the book of Acts. It shows us the church we're supposed to be. We can be. Amen. Amen. And because of this, and because of that, because of this, because of that, whatever you want to say, there are no more excuses or reasons why we can't do it. There's no more excuses or reasons why we can't do it. God has equipped each one of us. Amen. He's equipped each one of us to do his work. Amen. He's equipped each one of us. There's no limitations. There's nothing holding us back. All we have to do is pick up our cross daily. Everybody say pick up your cross daily. And keep our life positioned towards him. Pick up our cross daily and keep our life positioned towards him daily. If I'm in a position, if I'm not looking at Jesus, I'm looking at somebody else. If I'm not looking up to heaven, I'm looking somewhere else. Position is, position is very critical in our walk, if we do not position our eyes in our life, in everything in our in everything in our life towards Jesus, we're not going to we're not going to experience Him. We have to we have to keep our position in life correct at all times. Amen. That keeps us. That allows us to run the race. People drop out of the race because they're not they're not they're not focusing on Jesus. They're focusing on the problem. They're focusing on their family. They're focusing on their wife. They're focusing on their ministry. There are pastors that actually they drop out of the race because they're worried about their more more about the ministry than God. There's lots of pastors. They're worried about how their financials more than God. I don't care. I'm saying all I do is preach it. All I do is, all, all pastors, are, they're supposed to do is preach it. Don't worry about if you tithe to give offerings. That's between you and God. You know? My job is just to, is, is, is to stay focused toward, towards God. And if that, when, I, when I'm focused towards God, I'm giving you the right message. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I'm leading you well. Amen. Amen. I'm still, I'm still going to stay in my race. I'm going to stay in the race that God has for me. Because... When you don't, when you don't, when you take your eyes off of Jesus, you start half-stepping. You start half-stepping. You start half-stepping. Half you don't take full steps, you take half-steps. And God said, doesn't want us to take, he doesn't want, to, want us to take half-steps. He wants us to step boldly to the throne. Amen. Boldly to heaven. Amen. Because there's too many Christians and too many churches that are half-stepping in their walk. And half-stepping means you're being lackadaisical, you're being sloppy, you're being lazy, you're being inconsistent, you're being unreliable, and you're un un unenthusiastic. You come to church, you just sit there like you're a rock with lips and, 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 and eyeballs. And half-stepping is a modern-day way to describe a lukewarm Christian. And let's turn to the book of Revelation. Oh, we just got done. We just got done with it. We're going to go right back to it, Mr. Lewis. And in the book of Revelation, Jesus talks about seven churches, and these churches were in Asia Minor, which was which is in modern day Turkey. Turkey, what a what a great name for a country, Turkey. Could be bacon. 
But each church that that's listed in, 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 in Revelation, it represents a period of time in, what, in, in a church age that started at Pentecost. Because the church started at Pentecost. And one of these churches was Laosidia. Can you say Laosidia? And the church at Laosidia was one of the churches that was rebuked by Jesus for being lukewarm. And let's go to, we're going to, I think it's up right here, Revelation, it's already on the screen for you because I've pushed the button too many times. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. And this is something I want you to listen to. I want you to take heed, like the Bible says, take heed. Take heed means pay attention because, you know, when you don't pay attention, stuff goes by and you, and you miss out. Starting with verse 14, it says, write this letter to the angel of the church, church in Laosidia. This is the message from the one who was the amen and faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. <clears throat> Verse 15, I know all things, and this is talking to the church itself. I know all the things you do that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. Verse 16, and this is where it gets, this is where it just, it just, uh, uh, Jesus drops the boot. But since you are lukewarm, like, like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. How many of y'all want to be spit out your mouth, spit out Jesus' mouth? How many of you want, first of all, who wants to go in the mouth and be spit out of mouth? Nobody wants to be spit out of mouth. But Jesus is he, he, Jesus is telling us, do not be like the like lukewarm church. Don't be like the lukewarm church at Laosidia. Don't be like it. Don't be lukewarm. Because lukewarm churches are neither hot or they're neither cold. It's lukewarm like lukewarm bath water. Jesus says you need to pick and choose what temperature you want it to be. It's, it's only two choices. Hot or cold. Two options, two choices. But the reality, what Jesus was basically, he was, he was, he was telling us, he was prophesying about, is that you know there, there are going to be churches and there are going to be Christians that are lukewarm. They're neither, neither, they're neither hot or cold, cold or hot. It's because they're not all in. It's because they're not all in. And the reason they're not all in is because they're not fully committed. They like the title. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I wear a cross. Go to church twice, twice a week. Eastern Sundays. I do that. I like the title. I like the benefits because I, I, I pray and God answers my prayer. I asked him for I asked him for something last week and he gave it to me. They like the they, some of them like the benefits, but they're not all in. Not all in. And God, and, 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 and this, this, this hurts the kingdom of God because God cannot fulfill his plans with lukewarm churches and Christians. He can't fulfill his plans. There has to be a commitment. And you have to choose heaven and make the kingdom of God number one in your life. There's no beating around the bush. No beating around the bush. There's no watering us down. Some people want it to be watered down and they want it, they want it, to, be, they want it to be beaten around the bush, but it's not. God wants us to follow him. He wants us to follow him. Follow him. When, when, Jesus, when, when Jesus was um, speaking to the men, he said, follow me. Right? Follow. Follow. Let's turn to the book of let's turn to the book of Matthew right now. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. This is about following, following, following. Everybody say follow. 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 We play um, games as a kid called follow the leader. We play Simon says. You follow whatever Simon tells you to do. But God says, follow me. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. It says, and this is talking about, this is talking about his first two disciples. He called, that he called to follow. 
One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, we know Peter, hot Pete, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. They had a job. You had a job. They were fishermen. All of us have had jobs before. Some of us still work in, in, in the field, in the, in, the, in the workforce. But they had jobs. They were fishermen. Verse 19, Jesus called out to them. And everybody say, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to say this with a, with, a, with a louder voice. Come follow me. Come follow me. And I will show you how to fish for people. I'm saying, first of all, first of all, he, you know, he's saying, come follow me. I will, they fish for fish, not for people. He's probably like, this dude's crazy. Fish for people. But the response, the response was powerful. Verse 20 says, and they left their nets at once and followed him. They left, they left their nets at once. There was no hesitation. There was no worry. They just did it. That is powerful. That is powerful right there. They just did it. They obeyed, obeyed immediately. And I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to me. And this is up on the screen. Actions speak louder than words. Amen. You can talk all the crap you want to talk. You can say anything you want to say. But when it comes right down to it, your actions speak louder than your words. Because words are really cheap unless they're backed up by action. You can say you you can say my relationship with God is just so it's so tight, it's so tight knit. But your actions, you don't act like it. You're not you're not showing the actions like it. Because actions they tell they tell others. And it's not to be judgy, because we're not we're not supposed to judge, but they tell others what you truly feel. They tell others what you truly value and what you truly treasure. And actions, and the thing about actions, they don't require words, or they don't require, require speeches. Some, you know, they don't require much. Actions are one of, and, and, and this, is, this is what I want you to hear too, actions are one of the greatest indicators of what's in your heart. Amen. They reveal the heart which is not visible to the human eye. But the thing about um, actions is they're powerful because they give you a snapshot of the heart, of what's inside the heart. Amen. When Peter and Andrew, when they left their nets, when they left their nets, it signaled, it signaled that to, to Jesus, it signaled to everybody, um, it, signaled, it signaled to us, to us today, that they were all in. They were fully committed and they were fully dedicated. And the question God, God asked for each one of us, are you fully in? Are you fully dedicated? Are you fully committed? Are you all in? Are there any nets? Are, any, are there any nets that God is asking you to, to drop? Ooh, are there any nets, nets God is asking you to drop? That's a question you're, you're going to have to answer. I can't answer for you. And you know, you and you got If you don't know what it is, ask God. Pray to Him. Pray and ask God. Do I have anything in my life, any nets that I need to drop? And we know, and we know, we just we know that God is calling each one of us to a deeper, more intimate relationship with Him. We know this. In order for this to happen, we're going to have to be all in. And this, and this means this. This means letting go of things that we might value and, and, and cherish. They're not, they're not saying that they're bad for you, but you might have to let them, them next drop. It might be your time. It might be, it might be money. It might be relationships. It might be preferences. It might be traditions. It doesn't matter what it is. What matters most is that you drop your net. Because when you drop your net, you're telling God you're all in. Peter and Andrew, when they dropped their nets, they, they said that signified with their actions to Jesus that they were all in. I'm giving up fishing for fish and I'm fishing for men. Amen. Amen. All right, right now, we're, before we close, I want to I leave you, I got three takeaways about dropping your nets. 
three takeaways about dropping your nets. Are we good today? Are we good today? This is the word for 2024, all in. We have to be all in. There's no more excuses. There's no more, there's no more just, you know, um, just, you know, things, um, side things. The, side, the devil likes to get us, get to, get us and, and, and life likes to get us with, with things on the sidelines. Continue going down the road that God has called you to travel. Don't worry about other stuff on the side of the road. That stuff is there. It's probably going to be there next week and next year. But let's look, let's look at three takeaways about dropping your net. Number one, number one, dropping your nets allows you to pick up your cross daily. So you can't pick up your cross with full arms. If, you're, if your arms are full with different things in your life, you can't pick up your cross. Something is going to have to be put down. And for many Christians, they'd rather drop the cross and keep their nets. They love the nets of money. They love the nets of material things. They love the nets of the world. But just like fishing, when you, th when you throw a, a net down in the water, you don't know what you're going to get. You know, there are many Christians who have many, who have many worldly things in their nets and it's keeping them from going deep over God. This is why you have to drop your nets. You have to drop them. And God says, pick up your cross. Pick it up. Because the cross is better than anything. The, the cross is better than any, any net you'll ever own. Or anything in the net that you ever own. All right, let's go to number two. I only have three takeaways from this from, from today, for today. Number two, dropping your nets is a sign of transformation. When you no longer desire for what you used to desire, this means you're changing. And we're called to change. We're called to change. And change happens when you drop your nets. Dropping your nets, it changes your attitude and behavior. And you begin valuing, you begin valuing what God values and truly hating what God hates. That's what we're called to do. Love what God loves, hate what God hates. And you begin seeing everything with a different set of eyes. In Philippians chapter 3, Apostle Paul says that all the old stuff that he used to think was important, he counted, he counted as garbage. Is that what I'm saying? I know that's, that's been true for me. I'm just like, some things that I've just been like, you know what, this, this is, this, I used to put some value on this, but now I don't even care about it. I don't care about my degrees. I don't care about my, my bachelor's and my, my master's degree. Those are, garbage. those are, I'm using them, but I don't really care about them anymore. You know what I'm saying? You just don't care about things. You just, the old stuff just drops like flies. And, and in effect, like, you have new things to focus on and new things, new goals. And, new, and, and it's all God-related. God and it's, it's all about kingdom stuff, right? My best books in my house are the Bible and other books about the Bible. Amen? There's other good books, there's all other, um, other interesting things, but that's, that's the best thing. That's, that, those things that used to be important are just old nets that I dropped, and I just say, you know what, I gotta, I'm picking up the cross because I'm doing what God, I feel like God has called me to do, and I'm sure you're doing the same thing, amen. But Paul said all, Paul said all of his accolades and accomplishments and achievements meant nothing to Paul. They meant nothing to him. His greatest treasure was living for Jesus. That's why he. That's why. That's what makes Paul one of the great, um, great saints of, in the in the Bible. All right. And number three, the last, the last takeaway about dropping your nets is, I think it's up here. Dropping your nets is the only way God can fully use you. When you're when you drop your nets, it means you're letting go of the temporal and embracing the eternal. When your nets are dropped, your focus is on the eternal. Your primary, primary focus is no longer on your agenda. And this is a word. This is a word for us, me, you, for anybody who might be listening. One of the greatest treasures is being in God's will. That's where you're going to find joy. That's where you're going to find peace. 
Because when you're in God's will, you know that you're doing what you should be doing and you are where you should be. Amen? And this is when God can use you to achieve his purposes. We have purpose. We, have, we all have a purpose. We have a purpose to serve God and to do what he's called us to do. Like I say, like I say, we all have individual, um, we have individual um, um, things that God wants us to do, and he's called you to do it, nobody else. And for, and for, so let's go to Philippians 2, 13. It says, for God is working in you, because he is, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. When you drop your nets, God will give you the desire, the power and strength to do what pleases him. This means that God will transform you, transform your will as, as well as, as change your actions. So this is why when God comes into your life, you don't act like you used to act or talk like you used to talk. He gives you a new heart and a new spirit, the moment of salvation. Not saying that it's, it's it, you know, not saying that, you know, it's a transformation process, but he gives you, it's what, what, when you come to God at the moment of salvation, he gives you what you need. The seeds are in you. You just have to water them daily. Water them, water them. And, and people, you know what, the people around you water them too. You gotta be careful with friends. You gotta be careful with family. Sometimes you just, you can't be around them because they are going to try to damage that seed that God dropped in your spirit. And you just have to, you know, you have to be comfortable with that. Hey, I can't, I can't talk to you anymore. I can't see you anymore. I can't, I, can spend, I can't spend as much time with you as I used to because I'm changing. I'm changed. I'm changed. But all you have to do is let go of the nets and pick up your cross. And it begins at the moment when you decide to be all in. And God wants all of you. Up in the back, before we go to prayer, up in the, in the back right here, I have this. I have the word for 2024. And I, put, I, put, I printed it so you can put it on your um, refrigerator or wherever you want to put it at. Um, word for 2024, all in. And it has the Luke 29, Luke 9.23 scripture. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. So it's a copy for you. Take it, please. I'll print it for you so you can have it. Amen. All right, so if you could um, if you could bow your heads and join me in prayer, dear God, we just thank you for we thank you for today, God. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to, to 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 sing to you, to praise you, to worship you, to learn more about you, God. And God, I just ask that you continue just working in in our lives, God. Continue um, giving us that desire, God, as we come become closer to you, and as we our relationship with you deepens, God, just continue. Tell us what you want us to do. Give us our, tell us our, our, our purpose in each situation, God. God, we just, we want to do the will. We want to do your will, God. We want to, we want to live a life that's pleasing to you. And we know that the way to do it is to be all in. Because when you're all in, when you're all in, you can use us like you want us to use us. There's no more excuses. There's no more, there's no more procrastination. You give us a word and we do it. So God, I just pray all of us, God, through myself, God, we would just, we would just be, we would just, you give us that, that you would increase our obedience and submission. And God, we would just, we just, our number one priority in life would be to live for you. Live for you only. In every situation, family, friends, at church, whatever it may be, God, just, we want to be all in. We want to be all in. Like Jesus was all in. Your son showed us to be, how, how to be all in. He was all in all the time, never sinned, never lied, never did anything deceitful. And he lived with people that we live in. We don't live in the biblical days, but still we live, we live in 2000, tomorrow, 2024, and the same type of people were living during his time, but he was all in. He chose heaven over um, everything, over anger, over frustration, over slander and gossip. He chose Heaven, he chose you, God. So help us, help us do the same thing, God, as we continue growing and just growing in, in, in you and, and being imitators of you. 
that's what, that's what we want to do. We want to, we just want to, we want to, we want to grow, we want to transform, we want to, we just want to be more like you each and every day. So God help us. Right now, I just want to ask anybody right now, um, if you if you happen to die today, you know where you would go. Because the Bible says that you're either going to go to heaven or hell. There's no in-between. There's no pur purgatory. There's either heaven or hell. And the Bible says the way to heaven is through the sun. Jesus, when, um, Jesus is the bridge to God, to heaven. So I want to ask, and, and ask anybody right now, and ask anybody who's online right now, if you... Um, have you ever made Jesus Lord in your life? And if you haven't, I want to give you an opportunity today to make that happen. But it's your choice. Don't let, don't let anybody um, try, to, try to push you there. You, it's your choice. It's your choice to walk. It's your choice after you become a Christian to walk in his ways. But if, if you, but if you feel, if you've been feeling compelled in your heart to, you know what, I just know there's more to life than just what I've been doing, you know, for these t past 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I want you to repeat the salvation prayer after me. This is a prayer asking Jesus to take away your sins and inviting him into your life so you can live for him and only him. So if you can repeat after me, anybody who's, who's here or online who wants to make Jesus with your life. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for forgiveness. Right now, I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that he died for my sins and raised and, and, and was risen and rose from the dead three days later. Father God, thank you for saving me and giving me life. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if this was you, you just asked Jesus into your heart. You asked him for salvation, the greatest choice you've ever made. And I'm saying I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you and heaven's cheering right now because whenever somebody receives Jesus as Lord, heaven just uh, is, is cheering. They're cheering. They're cheering in heaven right now because there's another person who was on their way to hell who is not going there anymore. So my next thing I would ask um, that I would encourage you to do is to find a church. If you have no church that that you know of or that maybe that you've um, that you've ever visited, we'd love you to come here to Lansing Calvary. We'd like to walk with you and talk to you and and and, and learn with you too. We just got done with Revelations. We're going to start a new study um, that, uh, for Sunday school next week. We also have Wednesday night study too. We're learning about the fear of God. So we have a lot of things going on. So if you like to. Um, if you like to, um, um, you know, come here and just join us and just visit and stuff, just get on our website, lansingcalvaryag.org, and check us out and uh, shoot me an email or just uh, call, you know, just shoot me an email. So that would be the great way to do it. Um, for the rest of us right now, um, are there any prayer requests right now? Any prayer requests? Anybody who, who has any type of, any type, anything in their life where they need prayer? Where there's two or three gathered, God shows up. Does anybody have any prayer requests? Sickness, health, relations. What's that? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. We're just gonna pray. We're just gonna pray for this. Um, we're gonna pray for this uh, message today. That it's it was it was it was given to me, and I just pray. And we're gonna pray that it actually takes place and, and and comes to fulfillment in all of our lives. So if you could if you could just if you want to if you raise your hand right now to heaven and just just raise your hand and we're gonna pray to God right now. Dear God, I just I just I, I thank you for that prayer request, God. God, you know what? Your your word. Your word is written in our hearts, God, in our in our in our hearts, um, in our minds, God. So, God, we know the word. We know what we need to do in order to choose correctly. We know what we need to do in order to live a life that's pleasing to you. Now, the next step, which you've which you've given to, like your creation, is to be all in, like Jesus was. The Pharisees knew your word. Other people knew your word, but they didn't go all in. So, God, I pray for each one of us, God, that we just would, would position 
our hearts, God, in our minds, God, in our lives, God, towards to, to you and, 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 and truly be all in. Truly just, you're a number one priority in life. You're, you're a number one priority in life. Everything is the backdrop of our life is the backdrop of heaven. So God, I just, I pray God that, you know, year 2024, God, this is the last day of 23. God, I pray that 2024 would be a year that everybody at Lansing Calvary would be all in. We would be fully committed. We'd be fully obedient. And we would do, we would be all about taking care of, of doing your will. And like Jesus, when he was a kid, I'm about my father's business. God, let us be about your business as, as individuals and as a congregation, God. God, I pray for the increase, God. I pray that we would win souls for heaven, God, because we know that the end, the end is, 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 is approaching. We don't know when, but we just, we, we, there's, there's signals and signs. And, and God, let us, let us be, um, let us be a, a, a church where people are like, souls are being saved. And, and miracles are happening, and, and the kingdom of God is, 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 is being manifested, God. I pray for revivals, God. I, I pray, God, that you would just use each one of us, God, not because of who we are, not because of how much we know, but because we're all in. So, God, thank you for what you're doing, God. I pray for, I pray for 2024 for protection, God, for health, God, for provision, God, for safety, God. I pray that everyone who's, who's part of Lansing Cover is associated with Lansing Cover. I don't care if they go here or not, God, that you, that, that you are taking care of, of each person, God. You're watching out for us, God. And, and God, you're in your in in your in your in your in, in your you're guiding our walk, God, and you're guiding you're guiding our direction, our steps, God. And God, we thank you for we thank you for this upcoming year, God. We just we want to thank you first of all. You gave us you give us 365 days in, in 2023, God, and we're we're thankful for that, God. We're thankful for that. But God, we just we just we're gonna we're thankful for seeing for 24, God. 24, let, be, let 20, uh, 2024 be a year of being all in and full commitment. So God, thank you for everything that you're doing. And we can't, give, we can't even give you enough thanks, God. But we just, we can live a life positioned to you that's all in. That's how, that's what we can do to thank you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.